And late today, the House Ways and Means Committee announced that it will hold a hearing this Friday. To help us understand the tax law and what these groups are charging, we're joined by Duke University Law School professor Richard Schmalbeck. He is a former tax attorney and former IRS attorney Jay Seculo. As chief counsel at the American Center for the Law and Justice, he is representing Tea Party organizations. He also hosts a conservative talk radio program. Gentlemen, welcome to you both. And Jay Seculo, let me start with you. Let's go back to the applications uh, that these groups sure. made for tax-exempt status. What sort of tax treatment exactly were they asking for? Most of them were asking for, our clients were asking for C4 status, which is uh, allows for uh, the money given is not taxable. It's not tax deductible by the donor, but it's not a taxable event to the organization. So it was a 501C4 legal status, and the application actually is very straightforward. And the first series of questions were not terribly intrusive. It was the second round of questions that uh, were very intrusive, and it's caused the problem here. Well, let me ask Professor Schmalbach, why, if, if they were seeking this status, which is tax-exempt, as we just heard him say, why then are they eligible for tax exemption? Well, there are a number of uh, organizations that are eligible, and I think uh, in many cases the primary explanation is that they are simply not activities that are engaged in for profit. Uh, and so the normal course of things would be that they wouldn't generate profit. They uh, spend their funds on activities that uh, advance uh, uh, some purpose. Uh, in the case of, of C4 organizations, they're, they're considered social welfare organizations and they are presumed to advance uh, social welfare. So it includes things like uh, volunteer fire departments. Uh, it includes uh, organizations. I believe the ACLU uh, is a 501c4. I think the National Rifle Association is a 501c4. And, and uh, Jay Seculo, I, I just want to pursue this very quickly to help people understand, because some sure. people are confused about the term tax exempt. They get this status. They're seeking this status even though they pursue a very strong set of beliefs, uh, as, as we just heard, whether it's the National Rifle Association or another sure. group. For example, today I got an email from a group that's a 501c4, but they are, they said, strategically partnered with a Republican group. But that's okay, right? Well, you're not, you can't be part of the National Republican Party or the Democratic Party, per se, and, and that's not allowed, but it's, it's exactly what was just said. Uh, the ACLU is a 501c4. They advance a particular agenda. That agenda is deemed to be beneficial to the social welfare. That includes their educational activities and their litigation activities. My clients were engaged in mostly uh, educational activities. They had civic forums. They had discussions on issues. Uh, they were not involved with a particular political party. Uh, that's where the line gets different. That's, the standards are different. It's a facts and circumstance test. But, Judy, at the outset, I think it's important to understand that 501c4s have been around for a long time. The right. ACLU has been one for decades, and they're entitled, I believe they're completely entitled to it. Uh, the fact is that what's happened here is, as the IRS has admitted, they engaged in targeted discrimination in picking out the groups with the name Tea Party or Patriot and then broadening it out to groups that were concerned about the Constitution. And the IRS has admitted that, but that doesn't prevent what's happened here. Then, Professor Schmalbach, what normally should happen or would happen if a group is applying for this status? What does the IRS, what are they supposed to do? What kinds of questions would they ask? Okay, uh, so in this case, uh, there is another type of organization, also tax exempt, uh, called political organizations. Uh, and they're exempt under Section 527 uh, of the Internal Revenue Code. And the IRS uh, position on this has long been that if you want to be a C4 social welfare organization, uh, you cannot engage primarily in political activity. And they define primarily as essentially more than 50 percent uh, of your activity. So I think the concern on the part of the IRS, and I think this is a legitimate concern, uh, a concern that they have an obligation to act on, is that organizations that are probably more accurately considered 527 political organizations prefer to be social welfare organizations under 501c4. And the primary reason for that is that 527 organizations have to disclose publicly the names of their donors, uh, and no such obligation exists for 501c4 organizations. Is so, Jay Seculo, is that, does that sound yeah. like the 
principal distinction there as these groups, these Well, that's, the, that's groups. exactly the law, but the, dif the difference here is that the questions that were asked by the Internal Revenue Service in their subsequent follow-ups, which is where the questions and the problems started, as the IRS acknowledged, were outside of the scope of a 501c4 question. They weren't relative to 527 questions for that matter. Uh, these were questions that were inappropriate under any circumstances. What's an example the IRS wants of to a challenge question? someone's C four state. Well, how about uh, conversations you had with uh, members of your family and what they may have said to members of Congress or uh, your membership lists? Uh, the, if the if you're applying for C four status, those membership lists are off limits. And the professor's right, and that, that's the difference between a five twenty seven and a five one five zero one C four. The C four organizations can engage in activity that deem, is deemed political as, not, as long as that's not their primary purpose. That wasn't the question, though, that was asked, Judy, and that's the problem here. It's the IRS uh, intrusive nature of their questions, which has created their own problem. And the only reason we know about it now, besides the fact that our organization objected to those questions when they were raised, is that the Inspector General acknowledged that that was a problem. That report's about to be made public. And that's the only reason that this is out today, is the IRS tried to get ahead of it. They asked the wrong questions to the wrong organization. So they weren't looking at the 527 applications. These were 501c4s. The IRS could have said, well, they didn't qualify, but that was never what they asked. Professor These were intrusive questions, nothing to do with 27s. Professor Schmalbach, what's the limit of what the IRS would be asking if they're determining legitimate tax exempt status? Well, I think uh, one of the problems here is that these questions do seem to me, uh, at least in some cases, relevant to the question of whether they are more accurately considered political organizations or social welfare organizations. So, for example, uh, if you knew that the primary Your donors membership data? to an organization were um, the Democratic Senatorial Committee, uh, that would uh, incline you to think that it was more of a political organization rather than a social welfare organization. So things like names of donors are not irrelevant. I am sympathetic to uh, the Tea Party in, in this respect, though. Uh, it, it, it is true that um, when if you are uh, awarded uh, C4 status, your application uh, must be made public. And uh, application is defined in such a way that it includes all communications with the Internal Revenue Service. So there is a bit of a catch-22 here. The, the uh, IRS says uh, basically that you are entitled to privacy as to your donors if you qualify for C4 status, but we're not going to approve your C4 application unless you disclose your donors, uh, and once you disclose them to us, they'll be right. disclosed to the public. So there is a problem. That's largely a problem of Congress's making. Uh, there is a statute, Section 6104 of the Internal Revenue Code, that requires that public disclosure of the application materials. Uh, that could be amended to permit redaction of some uh, of the information that I think they regard as most sensitive. In less than a minute, uh, Jay Seculo. So what questions remain to be answered to get to the bottom of this? Well, I think we know, number one, need to find out who authorized this because this did not come from this idea that these were low-level agencies. These were tax law, tax-exempt specialists. I was, as you said, I was in chief counsel's office of the IRS, that we, we were their lawyers. So I'm, I mean, these were not low-level people. These were well-trained revenue agents specializing in tax-exempt. We need to decide who determined to coordinate these audits, why they picked names to go after, and find out who's responsible. At the end of the day, the president said today, if this in fact happened, well, his own staff, his own team has acknowledged this has happened. As I said, the White House counsel was notified of this uh, in late April. And, and very quickly, Professor Smallback, what would you add? What questions need to be answered to get to the bottom of this? Uh, I don't disagree with, uh, with the list that Jay just offered uh, very much. I guess the one thing that I would say in conclusion is that when people hear that uh, organizations with the name Tea Party in them have been targeted. Uh, it's hard to imagine an explanation for that that isn't rooted in political bias. But there is an explanation, possibly, that's rooted in a legitimate effort to try to distinguish political organizations from social welfare organizations. And no. I think if you asked 100 people on the street uh, what the Tea Party is about, I think uh, most of them would say that it's a political organization. So this is... Uh, at some level, a legitimate inquiry, even though the IRS may have bungled it. Well, gentlemen, we hear you both, and uh, this story continues. Professor Schmalbach, Jay Sekulow, we thank you both. Thanks, My pleasure. Judy. Thank you.